Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's coffee chat. My name is Daniel Truckenbrough, and I'm an associate marketing manager at Brooks Publishing. And I'm very happy to have Nicole Edwards here today to talk to us about emotion coaching among providers and parents in early childhood settings. Uh, so before we begin, I just have a few things to go over. Uh, first, a few webinar tips for watching today's webinar. Uh, if you have any applications that are open on your computer, such as other web browsers or email, uh, if you close that, that can increase bandwidth and improve your viewing experience today. If you have any questions during the webinar, there is a questions tab in the question. It, there's a questions tab in the webinar panel uh, that you can enter your questions into, and then we'll be doing a brief Q and A at the end where we can take those questions. Uh, if you'd like to minimize the webinar panel, there's a little orange arrow at the top and you can shrink the webinar panel and enlarge the size of the presentation. And then if you want to bring that webinar panel back, you can click that orange arrow again and it'll bring it back to your screen. And if you are experiencing any audio issues during the webinar, uh, I'd first suggest that you check the audio tab of your webinar panel. Uh, make sure that you have the correct speaker selected and that your speakers are turned up. And if you're still having audio issues, you can either exit out and join back in or you can use the phone audio option that's in the audio tab and there's instructions for using that there. Uh, and if you go, go to the next slide, Nicole. So Nicole Edwards is the author of Early Social Emotional Development, Your Guide to Promoting Children's Positive Behavior. Uh, this is a practical and comprehensive resource to help birth to five providers work successfully with children, families, and colleagues to foster social and emotional growth uh, in young children. And if you'd like to learn more about that book, you can go to bpub.fyi forward slash early dash se dash dev. And we'll also be providing a link to this book in your follow-up email that you'll get tomorrow. And we are doing a book giveaway for today's webinar. So we'll be giving away one free copy of Nicole Edwards' Early Social Emotional Development. So one attendee will be selected at random and then notified after this webinar ends. Um, so if you enter your questions during the webinar, that can increase your chances of winning. And last but not least, uh, certificates of attendance are available for all webinar viewers and recording viewers. And I'll be providing a little bit more information about those certificates uh, later towards the end of the webinar. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce your presenter today. Uh, Dr. Nicole Edwards is an associate professor of special education at the Rwan University, where she teaches a number of courses, including positive behavior interventions and supports, and coordinates the master's in special education program. Prior to her role at Rwan University, Dr. Edwards worked at Georgia State University as an associate director of a statewide early intervention professional development initiative. Dr. Edwards started her career as a center-based and home-based early intervention provider in New York City, where she worked with infants and toddlers at risk with at risk and at risk for and with diagnosed disabilities and their families. Uh, Dr. Edwards is a member of numerous organizations, including the Division for Early Childhood of the Council for Exceptional Children, the National Association for the Education of Young Children, and Zero to Three. She also serves on the New Jersey State Interagency Coordinating Council to advise the State Department of Health on issues related to Part C early intervention programs and is the co-chair elect of the American Educational Research Association's Family School Community Partnership Special Interest. Uh, Dr. Edward, Dr. Edwards' research interests also include improving access to and the quality of early childhood intervention and early childhood special education, family provider collaboration and capacity building, the roles of caregivers and providers in early social emotional development, and effective implementation of positive behavioral interventions and supports. Uh, so, Nicole, thank you so much for joining us today. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I think we're going to do a poll to see who's here today. All right, let's get this poll started here. So audience, you will see a poll coming up on your screen now and you can enter your answers in. Um, so we're just asking who's here today um, and you can select from these options that are on your screen. So we're getting a some responses in now. It looks like there's a about a 30-30 split between direct service providers and other uh, followed by program directors and supervisors, uh, and then service coordinators, and then lastly, mental health providers. So I'll just let this run for another second or two. Um, and then I'll end this here and we can share our results. And Nicole, can you see that on your screen? Um, yes, I could see it in the attendance view. That's perfect. Okay, great. Okay, so we have... Um, such a nice array, and I think we have um, we have so many of you who registered for today. So thank you so much for your interest in this topic. Um, this is really helpful. Dan, should we uh, continue with the? I can get started now, right? Yes. Yep. 
Absolutely. All right. <laughs> All right. Thanks so much, everyone. So um, as Dan kindly shared, you know, I have I have a background in terms of my educational as an educational researcher, uh, as a former EI provider. Um, but what I wanted to also share with you is I really value authentic connections. And so through my own work with students, but also as a mother, um, I um, I just want to minimize this one second. I I'm a, I'm a mom to two wonderful boys. Uh, you're going to see a little bit about them today, just, just in terms of some, some examples. But I really value that um, I come to you from everything I share with you today, I've actually experienced as a provider and as a parent. Um, and so I just wanted to share that with you. Um, that that's important to, for me to let you know. Um, what we're going to share today in this very quick hour is this overview of emotional development to make sure that we're all on the same page with some key concepts. Um, possible signs of dysreg emotion dysregulation. Um, you know, it's not our place to diagnose as educators, as providers, but it is our place to recognize red flags and to bring those red flags to the attention of pediatric providers and families. So we'll talk about some of those today. Um, emotion coaching, uh, more specifically, how adults' res uh, responses link with emotions and behavior, and whether you and others embrace your role as an emotion coach. Uh, the fact that you're on this webinar today, you're probably either already doing this or you're curious to learn more about how to do this. So I'm really excited to share some things with you today. Um, and last but not least, uh, the importance of communicating with colleagues and families around our shared contributing role in emotional development. You do not need to have all the answers before you then reach out to your colleagues and families. This is really about this shared partnership and brainstorming to best support early emotional development. Okay, so just to get an overview, um, when you think about you know, understanding early, early social emotional milestones and emerging emotional development, I'm really looking at the first five years of life with this presentation, but really, and really how it sets the stage for uh, later development. So if you think about just, just the very first year of life, there's this emphasis on primary emotions. So um, the ability to feel fear or joy or sadness, um, anger or surprise. That's all happening in that first year of life. Um, it, it isn't until like the second year of life where you might feel different emotions, secondary emotions, uh, such as embarrassment, empathy, pride, or guilt. Um, so just, just having that awareness as a provider, it's helpful to know when we should expect those things, typically. Um, there's also this emerging ability in that first year of life where children are going from this automatic reflective pattern um, such as sucking their finger to actually more intentional and voluntary responses, you know, where they're turning their head away from a stressful situation or they're grasping at something that's soothing. So really just the, this idea of where children are in development um, and so that, you know, as they progress into preschool and kindergarten, we should expect that they will be more goal-directed. We should expect that they should have this emerging ability to control their emotions, to problem solve, to follow complex directions, to follow rules, uh, to internalize values and standards of behavior. You know, this is what we do in the classroom. This is what we do at home, right? Different expectations, but really being able to understand what those around them value and expect. And when you see at the bottom where I talk about initiating and sustaining social interaction, um, oh, excuse me, uh, we're really thinking about this ability to resolve conflicts, develop and nurture friendships, and accomplish interpersonal goals. And so you might be thinking, Nicole, you know, this is great, but you know, should we really expect this of a preschooler? And while we should start to expect all of these things, the key word to get out of this slide and the slide before it is that it's emerging. And the fact, the fact of the matter is if we miss this window, many of us might be thinking, I know adults who are still working on controlling their emotions in different contexts, right? We all are. I think this is, we're all works in progress. And so thinking about this lifelong process, that there's a continuous reorganization of emotional competencies. So just think about yourself, you know, how we'd start off as an infant, you know, through your teenage years, and now as an adult, Things that worked for you as a teenager may not work for you as an adult in terms of how you respond to emotion, how you process emotion, how you, um, your outward expressions in response to different stimuli. So it's really not this, you know, one and done and, you know, sorry, you missed the window, it's too late. Um, 
even if you yourself never experienced emotion coaching um, from loved ones around you, you could still reflect and commit yourself to being that person in a young child's life who does use emotion coaching, right? So I get, I really wanna emphasize that it's this, this lifelong process. I also would love to spend an entire hour just on this one slide. We, we don't have time to, <laughs> but this one slide really encapsulates something that, you know, if someone says to you, oh, a child's biting, you should do this. I would run. I would run the other way as quickly as possible. Do not accept any cookie cutter responses when it comes to social emotional um, issues, concerns, frustrations, because there's so much variability. There's so many nuances to consider. Uh, so even today, I was very cautious to give you some tips and suggestions, but being mindful that there's a lot of, there's a lot of variability to consider. So you want to avoid labels, even though you might come across research that says, in this sample of children with autism spectrum disorder, they found this with regard to their emotional development. Um, you might know a child with autism spectrum disorder who doesn't fit into that, character, into that description. So we don't want to say all children with autism blank or all low-income families need blank, right? We want to be very thoughtful about the strengths, needs, preferences, um, and the context within which we're supporting children. Um, we also want to think about things like temperament. You know, how many of you are so eager to meet new people, or maybe you're more shy when you first meet a new person, right? That's more like just your temperament. There's nothing wrong, right? There's a spectrum in terms of uh, your response to changes, your frustration tolerance. Um, there's this wonderful video I'm asking Dan to share with you after today's webinar, um, which is from the Center for the De Developing Child at Harvard University that looks at executive function in the earliest years of life. And things like inhibitory control, working memory, um, focus, um, cognitive flexibility, we can actually teach children to enhance those skills that will help them with their social emotional development. Um, things like um, how children are socialized, you know, you, know you, you might have heard, you know, you know, the stereotypical boys shouldn't cry, right? You know, um, I have two boys and I encourage them. I say, it's okay to show whatever emotion you're feeling, but in different homes, that may not be the message they're getting. So how are children socialized to use language? Um, and it's really not about tolerating emotion, um, cultural linguistic differences. It's really about embracing them. You know, find out what your families on your on your caseload in your classrooms, what do they value? You know, what is okay in the house? And it may not be okay in the classroom, but that doesn't mean it's wrong. So really thinking about what do they embrace culturally um, and 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 um, and just supporting them and reaching common ground with the, with your families. Um, and also this idea of toxic stress. You know, sometimes there could be different levels of violence. Um, different stressors in the child's life that could actually change the developing brain. Um, and, and there's some really interesting studies on that. So there's just a whole host of considerations that I want us to go through today's webinar, but being mindful of those, of those nuances. Okay, so you might be wondering if this is a folk, if we're just focusing on social emotional development, why would I highlight a chart of typical milestones that don't include social emotional, right? Why am I looking at fine motor, gross motor, co um, cognitive, expressive and receptive language? And so, if, you know, if you think about where children might typically fall, and I always have caution around milestone checklists because this is just an estimate. There's so many unique variations and splinter skills that we could get into. Um, but the reason is, if you really care about emotional development, you should really assess where that child is in these other domains. Really take the time to think about, well, where are they in their cognitive and their motoric abilities? And I'm gonna show you why, why that might be helpful. So if you think about mobility, for example, imagine a child, and again, I'm not saying that they're gonna say these things out loud, but with increased mobility, you know, I can now turn my head um, away from this, away from this stressful uh, stimuli. I can now reach for my favorite teddy bear. I can now move closer to a trusted adult. 
right? So they increase mobility, they can now have more options when it comes to their emotional development. With improved language and communication, I can now more easily tell you how I'm feeling or what I want. How many of you on the call uh, might work with children where they don't have um, the language or the communication skills yet and how that you might notice that they get more frustrated because they're trying to communicate with you and it's, it's hard for them to, to express themselves. And so you might see that go hand in hand if you give them different ways to communicate, the behaviors might improve. And similarly, if you have improved cognition, they can now learn what is expected of them and how to figure out solutions. Like, okay, I, have, I, I can go to this person or I can go to this cabinet to get this, this you know, um, support. So thinking about growth across domains is really important. And another key piece that I just wanna make sure we're all on the same page is up until this point, I've talked about emotion development, emotional development. Well, emotional development is actually broken down into three areas. So emotion knowledge is the first one. Um, it involves an emerging ability to infer or identify basic emotions from facial expressions or situations, use proper emotion language, and learn to identify others' emotions that may differ from one's own in the same situation. So think about yourself. If you are, how many of you love roller coasters, right? There are some of you where being on an emotional, um, uh, uh, a roller coaster, excuse me, is going to elicit joy. For me, if you put me in a, on a roller coaster, I'm going to have a lot of fear um, and sadness <laughs> that I'm not sitting on the bench taking pictures uh, where I prefer to be. Uh, so this idea of emotion knowledge is if you were to show a child an emotion chart, for example, is that child able to think or say or hold up a picture card that says, you know, um, he's feeling sad or, you know, look at this character in the book. How do you think they're feeling right now? Or when did you ever feel that way? And you can really teach this and really reinforce um, labels for their emotions. So if a child's crying, you could say, are you feeling sad that he took your toy? And you could actually label it and give them the words because they may not necessarily auto or automatically have those words. So really emphasizing that vocabulary. Another piece of this is emotion expression. This refers to ways in which children display their emotions behaviorally. Uh, this includes showing appropriate affect or emotional response during social interactions. So if your friend falls and hurts his knee on the playground, smiling is not going to be the appropriate, the adaptive response in that case. Um, or I might really be excited that it's playground time and I want to run, but I'm going to walk slowly because I know that's what ex what's expected of me. Right. Or I'm really excited by the book we're reading, but I'm not going to jump up and down. I'm still going to stay seated. And so this idea of how they express their emotions might need support from each of you. And the third one is emotion regulation. This has to do with children's emerging ability to self-soothe and control or inhibit impulses. And probably the reason that so many of you are joining us today for today's uh, coffee chat. So a child who's visibly upset, they might cry or with the right supports from you, they might learn to ask for the cool down corner where they could play with the sensory toys to self-soothe and start to calm down, right? So when you think about emotion regulation, that seems to be the one that, that makes people most concerned. And so I, I would love for you to think about a child in particular. Um, are you thinking of a child who has difficulty with self-soothing? A child who maybe has difficulty understanding or labeling emotions, um, where you are encouraging them to move away from a stressful situation, but it's hard for them, right? They're perseverating on it, and it's hard for them to redirect their attention. Um, it's a quiet activity, but it's really hard to stay calm. Um, Transitioning is a fancy way of saying going from one activity to the next. That could be very difficult for some children. You know, they're doing something they love and now you're telling them it's cleanup time and they have to go to a different activity and you might start to see some of those emotions and, and reactions. Um, calmly managing personal disappointment. I know you were so excited to go outside, but look, it's raining. We can't go outside anymore. For some children, hopefully, they would say, okay, and 
be redirected to another activity. But for a young child who's having concerns in this area, that might be a trigger where they start to cry and, and have a hard time coping. Um, and also engaging in appropriate social interactions. There was a wonderful uh, coffee chat a few weeks ago on friendship, friendship development. I encourage you to check it out. Um, I, I watched it as well. Uh, but this idea that we can teach children in all of these areas, but this might be a sign that you might say to the parent, you know, I'm concerned. Here's what I've noticed. Here's the data I've collected. Um, what are you noticing at home? What are you, what, you know, is this what you're noticing um, when I'm not here? And so there's a lot of literature out there, but to have that conversation around, um, they should at this point in their development start to have a bigger repertoire for how to manage these difficult situations. Okay. If you're feeling frustrated, you're not alone. I don't know if misery loves company, but that's uh, the, the reality is emotional and behavioral problems are among the most prevalent chronic health conditions of childhood. Um, estimates vary. Um, one estimate suggests that 19% of children ages 4 to 17 have minor to severe difficulties with emotions, behavior, and getting along with others. And then that number can go up to, that percentage could go up to 26% or so uh, for children in lower income homes. Um, and again, you might've also heard of being kicked out of preschool. There was this article on that, um, this idea of preschool expulsion rates being three times higher than all of K-12 combined. So um, I always think of this little boy that I worked with. The mother came to me um, just so devastated, she said, you know, it was the first time I met her and she said, Nicole, I'm about to lose my job. I need him to be in a center. I'm a single parent. And she said, this is the third placement that I have for my son, who was two years old at the time. And she said to me, and I quote, if you tell me he can't stay in your class, I don't know what I'll do. And children are being turned away from some centers because of their behavior. And so this idea of, um, Something that I find optimistic is in the bottom sentence where it says one of every five U.S. children and adolescents is estimated to have a mental disorder that can become debilitating without intervention. And the reason why I think it's promising is that, was that phrase without intervention, that's you. That's all of you wonderful people listening today because you are the intervention. You can provide those supports, the reinforcement, the strategies to actually alter that child's developmental trajectory. And I really believe this and I've seen it firsthand. Um, and that little boy, by the way, where the mother said that to me, uh, within five or six months, no longer qualified for the program that he was in under me. And, and she said something to the effect of, um, you've given me a new child, I can't believe it. And it wasn't magic, it was just following his cues, giving him very clear, consistent, structured environment, lots of praise, um, and really having that connection with the parent to reinforce things at home. So we can make a difference. It's not easy, but we can make a difference, especially in these earlier years of life. Okay, if we're effective in all the hard work that you're doing, and I know you don't get enough credit for it, um, positive social emotional development correlates with more adaptive behavior, more positive social outcomes, and it improves school readiness and academic achievement. But it's not just about the child because we all know that the child is nested within that family unit. And so if we can help the child's social emotional development, this is actually linked to less marital conflict, less parental stress, um, greater confidence in their child rearing abilities. And as some of you might connect with and relate to, it can actually improve your birth of provider's self-efficacy your sense of self-worth, that, you know, I can handle this, I can do this. Um, you know, we, sh we should, you know, if the director comes in your room and the child's on the floor hysterically crying, how does that make you feel as a provider, right? We, we can kind of get nervous or embarrassed. So we want to build your capacity to then help the child and family. So that's really wonderful to have all of you on today for that, for one of those reasons. Um, I value the bioecological systems theory, Yuri Bronfenbrenner. Um, and in a nutshell, you know, if you think about these children, these beautiful children in the middle of your screen, they are not just 
on their own to figure that out life, right? Their ecology or their environment is really supporting them throughout their development. So they're supported by loved ones who are with them on a regular basis. Um, they are supported and by these models, peer models and the like, where they have, um, where they can see children on a regular basis and learn from them as well. Um, each of you as a provider, as a therapist, as a mental health expert, as a um, service coordinator, as a director, you are all providing those supports to the child and family. And of course, our pediatric healthcare providers as well. And so this is just people who are directly influencing them. But if I had more time with you, there are levels of indirect influence on that child as well. Um, so really fascinating um, to think about how, you know, hopefully, you know, I'll never meet the children you're working with, but by helping you, um, in a way, I'm hopefully helping your children as well. So we're all kind of connected in this endeavor. Okay, so when I was doing my dissertation work 100 years ago, <laughs> um, I came across Eisenberg, Cumberland, and Spinrad, which they, they were talking about how adults influence behavior through the mediating role of emotional development. So if you could actually spend more time as an emotion coach, really supporting emotional development, that's, that's really our focus. Um, and so I'm going to hopefully empower you today with some, some things to get you started on, on that journey. So uh, early nurturing is something that all of you, I think I'm preaching to the choir, but you know, the importance of this can't be emphasized enough. Um, Thinking about how talking, cuddling, these all positively affect brain development. Uh, we know that positive, warm, responsive interactions contribute to a host of positive outcomes for children, their social emotional development, their executive function, and their language and cognitive skills. It affects their memory, their concept development, and it even affects their ability to develop a stress response system just by having the talking and cuddling and that connection. So I was looking through some old videos, which is one of my favorite things to do <laughs> when it comes to my boys, but I was looking through something and I wanted to share this with you. Um, and so this was my younger son when he was just two months old. And so if this cooperates, I'll be very happy. I want you to take a look at what do you hear me saying to my son and how is he responding? Again, he's just two months old in this in this clip. Hi, are you so smiley? <laughs> what? Hi. Oh, are you the sweetest boy? Hi, Sean. I love you. I love you. Hi. <gasps> what? Oh. Oh. Hi. <laughs> yeah, I know. Okay, Dan, can you see my original screen? Yep, we're back in business. All right, so hopefully, I would love to talk with all of you, but the system doesn't allow, allow that. So um, uh, just in the chat, if you wanna type in, you know, what do you notice that I was doing? Um, you know, is this something that you hear other parents doing with their children? Because sometimes you might come across a parent, like I did, where parents have said to me, well, I'm not, I don't really talk to them because they don't talk to me yet. And, and so that's a teachable moment. That's a teachable moment for you as a provider, especially the service coordinators on the line who are listening and, and, the, and the other providers who work with infants, families of infants, to really think about, well, no, that's a perfect time to laugh, to focus on laughing with them and talking to them and really hearing their cues. You know, I said, yeah, I know to him, um, as if it was a real conversation. And so um, that's really something that we want to think about to have them trust and really rely on us, you know, really form a secure attachment in that earliest year of life. Okay, so where does this all fit? I just wanted to kind of highlight, you've heard a lot of Brooks um, coffee chats. I'm really um, humbled and honored to have been invited to talk to you today because 
this all fits within what you've been hearing already from different presenters um, over this year, where whether they talk about the PBIS model, positive behavior interventions and supports, this falls in that universal bottom blue level. Um, or if you're focusing on the pyramid model, and I know there's a lot of um, upcoming and um, previous um, chats on unpacking the pyramid model that I encourage you to check out, but really thinking about how do we nurture and support um, how do we how do we have those connections and build that rapport in the earliest years of development? So that's how this fits um, into that. I just wanted to kind of emphasize that for you. Now it seems obvious, like yes, Nicole, we know we should be supportive and kind, but what are you noticing in reality? In reality, how are people when it comes to reflecting on their words and their tone? Because what I've heard are things that really motivated me to write the book in the first place. Um, so these are things that I've actually heard teachers say to preschoolers. Uh, Stop yelling, we do not yell inside. So okay, again, they're modeling yelling, but they're yelling, don't yell. Um, who threw that? Come on, it's already June 1st. Or he's acting like a baby. I can't understand him when he cries, saying that in front of the child. Um, you're going to the director's office if you do that again, right? Very punitive responses. Um, I've also heard it from families. Um, I'm so tired of this. This is the last time I take you shopping. Um, go, you're upsetting me, get in there. Um, so we're, we're not quite at the place where I would like to be as a society in terms of, you know, really thinking twice about the words and tone, which really does make an impact on early emotional development. You absolutely have a right to be frustrated. So do parents, and that is a normal reaction, but we need to breathe, pause, and select words that really can help the child's development. Okay, um, you might have heard the expression, the phrase rapid suppression approaches. I'm encouraging us to avoid those. Um, I talk about those, those in detail in my book, but in a nutshell, we're really thinking about um, there, you know, yelling, hitting, overusing or misusing timeout, um, and things like expulsions or suspensions, and on a something that all of you might have experienced personally or just you've you've seen around you is taking things away you know why did you hit him i'm taking away your favorite toy um, why are you jumping on the couch i'm taking this away instead we want to think about catching the child being good and saying i love the way you're sitting i want to reinforce that behavior i love the way you were you kindly shared and you want to reinforce that behavior. So reinforcing the behavior you want to see as opposed to punishing the behavior you don't want to see. And, I, and there, there's a lot more to it, but um, basically, if we keep relying on these negative punitive responses to behavior, they really do fail to promote lasting behavior change. How do I know? Because you keep having to do them. You keep having to, you have to keep yelling or keep taking things away. Um, and one thing to think about is if behavior keeps happening, negative behavior keeps happening, it's because it's working. It's working. It's serving a need for that child, a purpose. And I'll show you in a few slides what I mean. Um, but we want to make the behavior no longer work for the child. And we want to teach them alternative replacement behaviors that's, that actually get their needs met in a more appropriate, adaptive manner. So you might say, well, where do I go to start looking at this? If you're not already familiar, flag this website. Um, Division for Early Childhood has what's called recommended practices. And this is just one example. And they have video examples and they have really great resources at this link. Um, but they say, you know, this is one of them. Practitioners promote the child's social development by encouraging the child to initiate or sustain positive interactions with other children and adults during routines and activities through modeling, teaching, feedback, and other types of guided support. Um, so that was just one example, but I really encourage you in terms of you know, having a conversation with your staff, especially the directors who are listening, about, well, where are we in adhering and in, in, in following these DEC recommended practices for all children birth to eight? Um, and so the topic today is on emotion coaching. And as Wilson and colleagues shared, it has to do with responding supportively, 
verbally labeling emotions, using empathy, and actually teaching children to understand and regulate their emotions. Um, you know, you might hear someone saying, stop jumping, but you wanna add with what they should do instead. You might say, you know, what you're doing is not okay, but you wanna end with what they should do instead, right? And really teaching them and supporting them. So um, this is a great point where I would have like asked you um, how, you know, individually, you know, what was your experience with this? You know, did you see this growing up in terms of having emotion coaches in your life? Uh, do you think as a provider, you're really strong in this area? And so I think I just want to have one of the takeaways is to be really kind to yourself in knowing that we're all works in progress and we're all trying to do this as best we can. Um, so I'm going to read a vignette to you, and I hope this comes out well on the webinar, so um, we'll just jump right in. But as I'm reading this vignette, I'd love for you to just get a piece of paper and a pencil or, or use your phone if you want to take notes and think about what do you hear Glenn, who's an occupational therapist, and Vanessa, who's the mother, what do you hear them doing that's in this realm of emotion coaching? What would you do if you were supervising them to really celebrate their efforts to be an emotion coach? Okay, so think about what you hear, what you see, take notes on your end, and I'm gonna read this. Glenn, an occupational therapist, enjoys working with two-year-old Sue and her mother, Vanessa, twice a week in Vanessa's apartment. Glenn is helping Sue with fine motor skills, such as using manipulatives and using her pincer grasp to pick up small objects. Today, when Glenn arrives for his scheduled session, Sue is clinging to Vanessa's leg and covering her face. Glenn bends down to Sue's eye level and softly says, I see how much you love your mom. It's great to see you again. I'll start laying out fun things on the rug. Just come over, just come over when you're ready to play. Glenn collects several of Sue's favorite small Lego people and lays them down on the floor. He notices that she's watching him with one hand still cautiously placed on Vanessa's leg. Glenn eagerly begins picking up the Lego people with a child-sized pair of tongs. He laughs as he successfully drops them into a tin can and says, whoa, who wants to try next? Seeing that Sue is still reluctant, Vanessa gently asks, Sue, are you feeling a little shy? Sue nods. Vanessa reassures her. It's okay to feel shy sometimes. Remember that Glenn is here to help us learn new things. Would you like mommy to go first? Sue nods and relaxes a bit as her mom sits next to Glenn to pick up and drop the Lego people. This is fun, Vanessa exclaims. When Glenn sees that Sue is calm, he motions for Vanessa to ask Sue if she wants a turn. Sue, I bet you can drop more in the bucket than mommy did. Sue playfully sits next to her mom and tries to use the tongs. Glenn offers some hand over hand support to guide her positioning. Together, they successfully pick up and drop three Lego people into the bucket. Then Sue pauses and says, me do it myself. Glenn and Vanessa celebrate her wanting to do it independently and remain nearby watching as Sue makes two unsuccessful attempts. She seems visibly frustrated as she grunts throws the tongs and pushes the bucket over. She runs over to the couch and covers her face crying. Being attuned to the situation, having talked about ways of responding to Sue in such situations, Vanessa and Glenn exchange a knowing glance. Vanessa asks if Sue is ready to talk about what just happened. No, Sue replies. Vanessa then slowly counts aloud to 10 while modeling how to take deep breaths. One, two, three. Sue follows her mother's example and takes deep breaths as well. Nice calming down, Glenn says, when Sue's crying has stopped. Are you feeling frustrated that you couldn't pick up the Lego people? Sue slowly nods. I understand, Glenn says. It's a brand new activity. I bet if we practice a little each week, you're going to get really good at it. Can we try again two more times and then we'll do something else? You choose if you want me or mommy to help you this time. Sue returns to the rug, willing to try again with Vanessa's help before helping Glenn choose a different activity. Okay. So did you all take some notes or kind of notice some things again in that realm of emotion coaching? 
um, hopefully, I just have some highlights here, you notice that they were aware of Sue's emotions. They know she's displaying frustration. And Glenn helps to label her emotion by asking her if she's feeling frustrated. They're accepting of her emotion. They don't try to force her to play when she's clearly not ready. They, they don't try to have her talk right away about what happened. Um, and so they're really accepting and they, and they give her that space. Um, but at the same time, they don't just ignore it and say, oh, well, we'll never do the activity. They then use this as an opportunity to teach more adaptive ways to help Sue manage her emotions, modeling how to calm down, not just saying calm down or use your words, but actually modeling how to take a deep breath, how to count to 10, um, praising her efforts to calm down, labeling the emotion they believe she's feeling, um, and offering options that provide Sue with choice and a sense of control. Okay, so hopefully you could pause this when, when this is archived and kind of reflect more on this, but um, hopefully this kind of helps you see um, how it's easy to see in others how they might be using emotion coaching. It's not always as easy to see in ourselves. And that's why in this next slide, I'm thinking about how, you know, after you listen to today's presentation, um, how could we encourage you to use more reflective journaling? And just to share some statistics, some, some findings with you from the literature, um, teachers who are not given opportunities to reflect on how they manage their own emotions um, and how um, that, that adults who ignore their emotions will likely have a difficult time supporting children with their negative emotions. So it really is healthy to think about, did I respond in the right way? What would have happened if I did this instead? Um, so another thing is given um, matching of emotion correlates with early adaptive regulation um, and that by reflecting, you could actually be better attuned to what the children's affect is showing you. So you might say, okay, that's, that's fine, but how does this look in practice? Well, how many of you have heard of an ABC chart, right? An antecedent behavior consequence chart. I, what I'm encouraging you to do is after you create the chart, add more reflection to it. And let's see how that would look. So here's a sample behavior chart, not related to the vignette, just, just separate from that. I pulled this from, from my book. Um, but here, just kind of focus in on the behavior in the center of the page. The child pushed my leg, covered his face with his hands, and screamed. First of all, I love that this is objective and measurable. You see nothing about the child was aggressive or rude or defiant, no red flag subjective words. It's just almost robotic, exactly what you saw the child do, okay? And right before that is what did, um, what was happening in the environment right before that behavior. Here the person writes, I asked the child to sit next to me on the rug to read a book, okay? What happened right after the behavior? I sternly said, we do not push or scream. The child refused to cooperate, okay? So you have to be really honest with yourself with what exactly did happen. Was it ignored um, or, or how did you respond? And instead of ending it there, which a lot of you'll see data forms where it say A, B, C, I encourage you not to end it there. Take it a step further to ask yourself two questions. What do you think the child was trying to tell you? And what do you think you could have done differently? So here in this example, I think the child was trying to tell me he was not interested in reading the book. Um, he tends to push and cover his face when he's frustrated. I need to work on giving him more appropriate ways of expressing his frustration. Um, also, what would have happened if I gave him a choice between two books or possibly two different activities? I also think I should have less stern and have been less stern and more understanding, um, especially because he just had a tough time saying goodbye to his dad. My response did not validate his emotions or teach him what to do instead of acting out. So I think the answer for a lot of these things is, you know, behavior keeps happening because it's working. And we, we don't have control over other things outside of our, our context, but we can make a difference in terms of what comes before the behavior, you know, typical triggers or our typical response to the behavior. And as an emotion coach, we can really be thoughtful about our um, what we can do on either end of, the, of, of those behaviors to really teach new skills. 
Um, I just wanted to highlight, I know we're running out of time, but I wanted to highlight quickly um, the importance of a repertoire. So if you have a child who cries, you know, child M is upset and he cries, and that's all he's doing. You know, if you think about a, um, somebody building a house and they reach for a hammer, they're going to be pretty limited because you need more than just a hammer to build that house. So similarly, if child M is crying, think to yourself, what other tools can I give this child for his tool belt? Could I encourage him to look away? Could I say, you know, when you're feeling this way, I, I encourage you to go, we have a cool down corner and actually have him walk to another part of the room or he could redirect attention on a desired activity. Or maybe it's a source of stress that you could just remove. You know, talk to the, your, your, the other stakeholders and say, you know, do we really need to have um, this scary th th this thing in the background? Can we just remove it from, from um, the environment? Uh, we could also use um, augmentative communication, pics, freight, or just teaching them scripted phrases to say things like stop, or I don't like that, or I need help. Um, instead of the crying. So again, we can't just say stop crying, we have to teach what they can do instead. So how are you in terms of being an emotion coach? Are you responsive and supportive? Do you consistently encourage attempts to self-soothe, cope and delay gratification? Do you offer a space to stop and think? I personally don't like timeouts. I think it's misused, but I love stop and think where I'll say, you're showing me you need to stop and think. You're showing me from your behavior that you need to calm your body. And when you're ready, you can come back. And so it's not punitive. Um, I'll even say things like, we need to calm our bodies. We need to go stop and think. Um, and so this is from a responsive classroom that I learned years ago. Um, so I just love this. And I talk more about it in my book about how you can use this with your students. Um, do you validate and label their feelings? And when you get upset, as we all do in front of children, it, kind of, it could have nothing to do with the children. You're just upset about something personally. Um, do you say, you know, I have a little headache. I'm not feeling well today. Or, um, you know, I, I'm just going to lower the music. You know. I'm, I'm not feeling as good, but do you give a brief explanation and model how you self-soothe? Because remember, the children are learning from you, not just what you say, but what you're doing. Um, and also, do you use children uh, emotion-based books? Um, I highlight just one down here where it's uh, Moody Cow Meditates, but there are tons of emotion-based children's books that I encourage you to check out. Um, and also, mindfulness training is getting a lot of attention, uh, so I encourage you to explore that as well. So uh, Dan, this would be a great place for the poll if we could if we could launch this one real quick. Let me get that started here. Thank you. All right, should be coming up on the audience's screen now. And so the audience, you can just select from the responses that are on your screen, and then we'll share results in just a moment. And Nicole, just as a, an aside, we were getting tons of comments about that video of you and Sean and just how oh. great that interaction was. And Oh, nice. Yeah, I think he gets tired of looking at it, but I, I like <laughs> he, He's eight years old now, so he's, yeah, but uh, yeah, I, I love that, that, that video. Thank you. <laughs> and please feel free to share it if it can help with, with uh, your centers. All right, so I'll go ahead and close this poll now and I'll share the results. And can you see that on your screen? I, I can't yet. I, I'd love for you to. Oh, um, can you share a little of the second? I've recently been more aware of my emotions. Is that uh, my role? Is that is that right? Yes, the yes. second the second one was the most selected. Wonderful. I'm so happy to hear that. And and those of you who've always used it, um, kudos. That's really it's really great. Um, and I and I'm excited to. I really appreciate those who said I'm unsure because I think that's that's really honest <laughs> um, and, and I appreciate that. And it's OK. It's OK to be unsure, but just to really think about what could I do moving forward to really embrace my role? Because you wear so many hats, but emotion coach, whether or not you admit it, you are an emotion coach. You are modeling for your children. So thank you. Um, I want to take the last few minutes to really build your repertoire with just a few more pieces. So. Um, 
Wheeler and Ritchie have this really great um, acronym called PASTE, P, uh, which I've, I've since shared. Um, in my book, I use the analogy of a bird leaving the cage. So it's kind of cheesy, but uh, just, just go, go with it for a second. So you might think, like, why did the bird leave the cage? Um, you know, my uh, <laughs> reference to a Maya Angelou poem, I'm, I'm not sure, but I, this, this idea of um, there could be so many reasons why a child is doing blank. Um, in this case, why is the bird leaving the cage? Oh, well, it's problem solving. He's just curious about how to use his beak to open the cage door. No, that's not it. It's actually for attention. He wants to fly closer to his owner. No, that's not really it. In this case, it's really sensory stimulation. It feels so good to flap his wings. It has nothing to do with whether he's getting attention for it. Um, or maybe it's access to tangibles. Maybe there's a berry out there and he just wants to go get the food um, on that branch that we, that we don't see. Um, or maybe it's to escape. You know, he's been confined in this narrow cage for so long, he just wants to, to leave the small cage. Um, so having paste, as I just kind of write that down, is it problem solving, is it attention? But it's not always easy to figure out so here's an example of Sean. That's a, <laughs> the same little guy that you saw in the first video. And you might think, well, why isn't he happy in this context? Is the chair not comfortable? Does he not want to be in there? Um, but then when you watch and you observe, as all of you do, you realize, oh, look at how happy he was. Oh, can you see that on your screen? There you go. When he got his food. And was just taking a quick minute later. Um, and so in that case, which of these functions makes the most sense? it's probably access to tangibles, right? And so how could I have given him maybe a sign to use, although I know there's, there's not, not all of you um, encourage that, but or maybe a picture card for him to shake to say food on it, so that instead of crying, he could have had another way to communicate with us. Okay. There's one more video I wanted to share with you. Um, when you think about abstract concepts for kids, please don't underestimate the power of visuals. Um, I have used this for years because I do a lot of business trips for conferences, for my work at Rowan University. Um, and so thinking about um, visual timelines, and, and there's some great resources I, I'll share with Dan to share with you, but um, you don't have to be an artist. That's why I say stick figures welcome. You can see in the upper right hand corner, that's my messy stick figure drawing. But this is my husband going through this with my older son, and you could see how comforting it is. And by the way, when I was away, um, my older son would, would hold it near him while he was sleeping. And my husband told me that he would look at it and say, oh, well, I'm doing this, mommy's here. And now when I'm doing this, mommy's here. And it gives them, at two, three years old, a sense of control. Um, so let's, let's just take a quick look at this. The, here you go. In the airplane? And let's see, there's Daddy sitting in the airplane. But you have two legs. And should I, what do I try for the rest of the day? So then you're going to go home with Mommy? You're big, well, this is, you're big one in this. Uh, well, maybe. Because there's no <coughs> more room to make him bigger. Yeah. Okay. And then show screen. All right, Dan, can you see my screen again? Yep, yep, screen's okay, back thanks. up. thanks. All right, so so hopefully all of you um, attendees, um, you know, you, you kind of, he, he, my son was more interested in how my husband was gonna fit in the stick figure airplane, <laughs> which maybe defeated the purpose, but the idea of walking kids through with visuals is so important. So in our final minutes together, I really wanna emphasize the importance of you know, communicating with key partners. You don't need to have all the answers to start the conversations, to say, this is what I'm noticing. What are you noticing? What works for you? It might be easier for those of you who are home-based um, because you, you're in the family's um, home environments, but please, those of you across settings, really make that effort to communicate. And this is, I, I always share these quotes because um, in 2010, when I did my dissertation work, I was honored to have 114 mothers um, agree to talk with me about how they see their role in emotion and behavior. And so if you can't sleep one night, there's a link to that <laughs> online, I'm sure. Um, but here are just some, some, hot, some quotes to think about. Um, so one of the mothers admitted, I get frustrated, I keep beating him, it's a waste of time, I'm not getting anywhere, uh, next day is the same thing. 
everyone tells me to beat them and that's not the right answer. Um, I have a problem with my emotions and my behavior. So if I get more info on it, I'd be open. Um, I feel isolated. I get a little bit of help over a long time. Waiting lists, far away appointments. I'm at the breaking point sometimes where I just break down and cry. His behavior, his behavior adds to it. I ain't got a whole lot of answers on how to cope and stuff. And so I share this because, um, first of all, I want to give a voice to these families because at the time, aside from collecting their data and giving them an um, incentive packet, I wished that there was more I could do. Um, and so I, I really feel this passion and urgency um, to convey to you the importance of not just focusing on the child, but focusing on how supported that parent feels. Because when you call and say your child bit today, without giving the next part of that conversation, which is what can we do about it? What can we do to support each other through this? It becomes more of a us against them instead of them feeling supported. And so there's also a lot of misinformation out there. I had a mother say to me, and I just took down her words, but I was um, a little surprised because she said, she's just going through a phase. She's only four. She'll grow out of it. She's not hurting anyone. Um, if she gets older, if she hasn't grown out of it by 10, then I'd be more willing to get help. But I don't want to jump the gun. And, you know, there are researchers who say if a child is doing these behaviors at age three and four, it's not likely to go away without intervention. And yet, how would this mother have known that, right? So we have to inform and build capacity in our families as well. And it's not going to happen overnight, but I really, um, in my book, I talk about how we could build that connection and really support coaching. Um, I don't have time to go through this the second vignette that I was hoping to, but this basically is saying that this father is trying to you know be supportive and not yell he he was he was he admitted to the provider that he often used yelling um but at, when the child started throwing these wooden blocks on the floor um he started his response his go-to response was stop throwing those blocks knock it off and even though the provider was saying you know ignore that behavior the father understandably was frustrated saying but he's making a mess i don't want him to think this is okay um so in my book i I walk through one example of how that provider actually not only modeled, but then stepped back and put the father in the driver's seat to let him practice while she was there. So, um, you know, how can we help families feel supported, respected, and empowered? Um, there are so many resources online. Uh, the amazing people at Brooks Publishing pulled some of the um, key insights from my book into these one pagers so there's a blog there's um, this handout page um, that i think dan put in the chat on five steps to helping uh, with positive interventions because you know as this quote sh was shared from one of the mothers sometimes you feel you're the only parent going through what you're going through um, you're like you're the only one and the supports aren't there so in addition to giving them all of these handouts and the modeling um, and the conversations, they'll start to realize they're not alone and you really do care about that, that family unit. Um, if you're not familiar with the Backpack Connection Series at the Technical Assistance Center on Social Emotional Intervention, I include a link there as well. They have these great one-page handouts in Spanish, Portuguese, English, um, really helpful on you know, how to help your child label emotions how to help um, use positive language around your child, how to use social stories, which are so valuable, um, really great resources. And I just wanna let, remind you again from my, from, this is from my dissertation research that you know, parents acknowledged that they want teachers to collaborate them. Um, they said things like, I gave him the tools and the teachers are fine tuning them. Or if a teacher's not teaching them the same thing, if the mom is not teaching them the same thing, they're not going to get better. Um, it's a package deal when it all comes together. It's, the teachers have been a blessing in my life. So I had parents say they'd be willing um, to, they'd be very willing to modify their behavior. Uh, the researchers on the line, if you're listening, um, I'm curious about what factors correlate with willingness on the part of the parents. They might be willing in certain contexts. And I think we as researchers need to do a better job of uncovering what those factors might be. Um, and lastly, and then um, before we wrap up, think about mode of outreach. So you might say, well, Nicole, I call them and they don't pick up the phone. Or 
um, I invited them to come in, they didn't come in. I asked that same group of 114 mothers from a Head Start, an urban Head Start, what is your preferred avenue of outreach from the school, from the, from the Head Start? And one person did say no, which is understandable, but look at the people who in the, fir in the next two, next two bar uh, bars, where they would really love someone to come into their home or talk to them on the phone um, or Skype now in, the, in, this, in this era um, to really show them what they can do, really coaching them. Um, then another group said, I really would like small group supports. Um, but look, look at the last two columns of people who really prefer more private spaces. They don't want you to call them on the phone. They don't want to come in, but they would love things sent home. They would love written information or even a video that they can watch and play back. So I encourage you, especially the directors on the call, to just think about creative multiple ways to reach families. Don't just rely on one, one way. Um, so I think we're, wrap, we're, we're gonna skip that poll because we're out of time, but there's some resources I'm gonna share with you, um, some video clips, other things. And my email address is um, hopefully, it's on the first page of the slide. So um, really thank you so much for your time. Um, I really hope that this helps you start thinking about your, your role in being an emotion coach. And um, yeah, just, just thank you. Hope this was helpful. Excellent. Well, thank you, Nicole, for a fantastic presentation. Um, so we are a little late on time. Um, I think we can take like one or two questions. Um, and I think these questions can kind of benefit the audience, the, the, everyone in, that's still in attendance. Um, so we had a few listeners that were asking, uh, what can we say to parents um, who tell them that they don't have enough time or they don't have the time to spend with their child creating uh, interactions like the one that you showed with Sean in your video? who don't have the time to, yeah, so so um, you have to, there's this thing called ecological validity, which basically is the suggestions we give families need to fit in their lives. So you could think, well, when are you alone with your child? Maybe in a car, maybe that would be the right time to show them when they can do it, right? So, so when they're driving, when they're driving to pick up, to, to run an errand, that might be a time, um, but it's really about, getting to know their routine and their schedule and what works for them and then and then helping helping to show them how these things aren't extras because people are already so overburdened and stressed but can actually fit within their lives if if that answers the question mm -hmm. yeah it's a lot of a lot of interactions that you can fit within you know regular daily routines you don't necessarily need to carve out the time to do that mm -hmm. Um, let's see. Uh, I know we had a few listeners who are also asking, um, do you have any like tips or suggestions um, for working with parents who are reluctant to take your advice or take your suggestions? Um, yeah, and and that might be the case for parents who, um, a lot of the parents I talk to are more willing to go to family and friends and le actually less likely to go to teachers. Um, and so I'm curious about, about this. So, so if they're less likely, I would say um, moving forward, you know, it might be harder with certain families, but moving forward, I would say proactive prevention is the best intervention. So if you start on day one and say, um, this is my role, but I can't do it without you, right? So we're, I, I, I'm really, I really value partnerships. Um, can you have a Zoom with the parent ahead of time? Can you call them ahead of time before there's any red flags, before there's any behavior to build that trust and that relationship? Um, if there's a roadblock, you might just you know, examine what, what are the concerns? Maybe having another parent talk to that parent might be helpful. You know, sometimes parents might be more comfortable going to another parent instead of to the expert. Even though we try to move away from the expert mentality, they can get nervous or intimidated. So um, if that didn't answer your question, follow up with me individually and I can, I can try to brainstorm with you. Great. Thank you, Nicole. Um, so I think that'll, yeah, unfortunately, that'll be all the time that we'll have for a Q&A. Um, but perhaps we can follow up with some viewers after the webinar um, and get some other questions answered. Um, but we just have a few things to cover to wrap up today's presentation. Uh, so certificates of attendance are available for all viewers that are in attendance today and for all recording viewers. So you can download that certificate of attendance either in the handout section of your webinar panel 
or at this link on your screen, bpub.fyi forward slash emotion dash coaching dash shirt dash dash cert. Um, and you'll also receive a follow-up email tomorrow that will have a link to the recording of this webinar, as well as a link to the certificate and all the resources that Nicole has mentioned during this webinar today. Uh, and then at the end of this webinar, you'll also get a quick prompt for a webinar survey. So if you can just let us know what you thought about this survey, uh, you'll also be entered to win a free copy of Nicole Edwards' book. Okay. And we are, ex we are extending a discount um, to all of our viewers today. You can save 20% on uh, Nicole's book as well as other products on Brooks Publishing uh, at our website, brookspublishing.com. And you can use the code COFFEE121 to save 20% on your order. And if you are looking for additional uh, coffee chats or other professional development opportunities, uh, we have tons of recorded webinars as well as a few more upcoming for our spring session, um, including the coffee chat that Nicole had mentioned on friendship skills. And you can find those at bpub.fyi forward slash coffee dash chats. And that link will also be provided in your follow-up email tomorrow. Uh, and then we do have a page of COVID-19 resources we are all hoping, I'm sure, that these resources will soon not be needed anymore. Um, however, you know, we're all still working through this pandemic. So these resources are up on our website. They include recommended readings and downloadable resources and other professional development webinars to help early childhood professionals and work. And you can find that at bpub.fyi forward slash COVID dash EC. And so with that, I'd like to say thank you to everyone that attended our webinar today and a huge, huge thank you to Nicole for this fantastic presentation. Uh, it was really great, Nicole. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you so much. All right. And everyone have a great rest of your day.